Welcome, friends. We are going to explore today an esoteric approach to the chakras. The subject of the chakras is quite prominent in modern spirituality. And anyone that does a kind of survey about the different teachings that are available, the different teachings on the chakras, will soon discover that the teachings coming from different people or different traditions uh, do not necessarily match. Uh, they are sometimes just different, and sometimes they are even contradictory. Now, most people as, tend to trust what when somebody is teaching, for example, about the chakras or about any other subject that is connected to the psychic world. So naturally, if somebody is teaching about that, we trust that that person uh, has a source of information that is valid and valuable, uh, or somebody that writes a book, etc. Now, unfortunately, this is not necessarily true. In any given topic, you know, which is a little beyond the perception of most people, uh, you will find different kinds of sources. You can you can have, for example, those who have a, a, a psychic perception and that they are writing or teaching from their direct observations. Now, of these, there are two kinds of uh, people. There are those who have gone through a process of systematic training under, let's say, yogic conditions. Uh, and then there are those who have some level of psychic perception, although not necessarily all that accurate. Um, the psychic perception is developing in humanity at this point in evolution, and as any new sense, any new kind of perception, uh, it is not uh, perfected inherently. We do need to train it. So there are people who can see the chakras. Some of them will see the chakras correctly, and some of them not necessarily so. Uh, then we have people who may not see the chakras, people teaching about this, who may not see the chakras, they are repeating what somebody else observed. Now, this is quite common in any field. You know, teachers in, the, in universities, for example, they are repeating what scientists have discovered, and they themselves have not made the experiments, if they are teaching science, for example, or, or not all the experiments of all the subjects that they are teaching. So this is not something that is wrong per se, but in this case, when a person is repeating information that those who can see the chakras uh, have discovered, then how valuable those teachings are depend on the original source from which this person is drawing. And then you have another kind of, of person, let's say, as a, in these types that we are describing, who may teach about this. And these are people who have studied what others who could see, perceive them directly wrote about them, but then they add their own ideas about it. In general, these are ideas that come from some kind of intellectual, let's call it speculation on the subject. Now, some of these uh, ideas may actually be accurate, you know, when we um, think about a subject, if we have developed what in theosophy we call a spiritual intuition, uh, we, may, we may sense and get to some correct conclusions um, out of our study that were not necessarily described there. But um, for many other people, these are just intellectual speculations. Oh, if this is like this and this is like that, then it, it makes sense that this should be like this or or it sounds fun or it sounds, you know, I don't know, just uh, poetical. So they may add elements which are not necessarily uh, correct. They, they, they don't come from a direct perception. So when 
uh, this is just like a general disclaimer that I'm offering to you in the sense that when you study any uh, any teachings that have to do with the, the psychic observation, um, then you have to consider the source. You have to try to trace the source and see if the original source is, you know, you, you can trust the original source. Uh, did this come from a person who you think is, you know, knows what he or she is talking about, who is a practitioner or who has some, you know, real credentials to talk about whatever that person talks? Or does this come from some sources that, you know, may not be, uh, you may not uh, necessarily want to trust right away? You know, in the Theosophical Society, there, there is freedom of thought. We don't tell people what we regard is true or not. We actually encourage people to develop their own um, discernment, to develop their, their own understanding. So even in the activities of the Theosophical Society, we provide teachings from different traditions. Uh, and some of those traditions may or may not agree with other traditions. Uh, so we leave this to people because we try to encourage intelligence in our in our audience. And just coming and saying, just believe in this, is not going to promote the kind of spiritual intelligence that, that the Theosophical Society wants to promote. Now, the fact that there is freedom of thought and that we explore different traditions doesn't mean that we could take for granted that everything that is being taught is real or is true. Uh, some may be and some may not be. Uh, which part is true? Again, this is something for you to determine. In, in the Theosophical Society, we don't make statements, dogmatic statements as to what is true or what is not. We do provide a particular point of view. And for example, I'm going to, to talk about uh, the chakras from the point of view of Theosophical teachings. Uh, so we do provide a particular point of view, but uh, then it is up to the audience, up to yourself, to decide what uh, you, you, you feel is true or not. So where is the information that I'm going to share with you? Where does it come from? From what kind of these, you know, these types of people that, that I mentioned uh, come from? Uh, well, I am not clairvoyant, so I am sharing information that has been gathered, collected by the direct perception of some, I would say, great clairvoyants that we had in the theosophical tradition. Uh, there are three of them here, C.W. Leadbeater, he uh, was active in, let's say, the early 900s, and uh, he actually did uh, clairvoyant research, which became the foundation of many of the subjects that we see today commonly in the New Age, let's say. The idea of the chakras was uh, the first brought up by, by him to the West. We will see this, it's a little more complicated, but the chakras as we understand them uh, was from uh, his original research the idea of the existence of an aura and the different colors and the, the different bodies uh, and, and many, the idea of thought forms, etc. This all came from his clairvoyant uh, research. Then I'm going to refer to information brought by Jeffrey Hudson. He was a, a, another uh, trained clairvoyant in the theosophical tradition. And then Dora Kuntz, uh, well, Jeffrey Hudson was active throughout the 20th century. And then Dora Kuntz, uh, also a contemporary, she, she died in 1999, who was also trained. She was trained by Leadbeater, actually. Uh, she was born with clairvoyant uh, powers, let's say, or faculties, and, and she was trained since she was 12, I think. She was trained by Leadbeater how to use them, how to see correctly, how to remove the the misperceptions etc and the reason why i mentioned these three there are other um, clairvoyants that we have had quite interesting but in the case of these three people 
their studies were corroborated by scientists. The three of them, um, well, let Peter, I, I can't go into, into this. We don't have time for this. Uh, we are going to have, uh, after this lecture, uh, a, a four-week class on the subject where I can go more in detail. But um, let Peter, let me just say quickly, discovered some, some atoms that science didn't know at the time. And when those atoms were discovered later, the scientists that got the Nobel Prize for, for that uh, acknowledged that these, these atoms had been discovered by Leadbeater first. Uh, Jeffrey Hodgson worked with three different scientific teams in the field of physics, in the field of anthropology. And the three of them, after Hodgson died, wrote um, a testimony, let's say, in saying that uh, they all saw how accurate his powers of perception, psychic perception were. And Dora Kuntz also, she worked with two doctors. Now she would do diagnosis of uh, people's illnesses uh, without knowing what their medical condition was. And she was always right. And she even saw illnesses before they developed. So by this, I mean, I'm not claiming infallibility in uh, the teachings, in the observations that they did. They did not claim infallibility. They say, you know, psychic observation is just like scientific observation. You there can always be some mistake in how you observe, or there it may be limited what you see, uh, just as science keeps correcting itself. Um, the, the same may happen with the psychic perception. But again, in science, the corrections are normally on details of you know, what you can see, uh, what you discover. The, the main facts uh, are normally correct. Uh, so this, I would assume, we, we can as have some degree of confidence that what they observed was correct. And the three of them did independent observations, and they agreed on all the major uh, observations of each other. So let's look briefly to a little to the history of how we learn in the West about the, the, the chakras. First, let me say the word chakra is a Sanskrit word, which means will or circle. And originally, this is a concept that is primarily in the Hindu tradition. They also have it in Buddhism. They have some level of description of the chakras. And you can see in other traditions that there may be the mention of a couple of centers. Uh, but I would say the main tradition that that described the chakras more in detail was the Hindu tradition. Uh, but in the early, or let's say in the late 1900s, we in the West didn't know anything about this, uh, anything about chakras, yoga, you know, me meditation, none of these subjects that come from the Eastern traditions. So actually the first time that, um, some some information about the chakras was published in English and that uh, began to reach the West was in the 1880, uh, 1880s, more or less throughout that decade, through a theosophical journal that, that is called The Theosophist. The Blavatsky and, and Olcott, the uh, co-founders of the Theosophical Society, were the editors of this journal, and they started publishing information about the chakras, mostly from uh, Hindu sources. So to start familiarizing the Western, um, the, the Western society with this subject. Then in the early 1900s, Leadbeater began to do his own direct uh, research, uh, psychic research of the chakras, and he began to publish them in uh, his writings, in his books, uh, and all, all the, the observations that he had. And then uh, in 1919 was published the, the first English translation of a couple of Hindu books, 
on laya yoga where um, the the a more complete description of how the Hindus understand the chakras was made available for the first time in the West. But you see, by this time, this is normally thought of by scholars uh, as the, the 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 first publication on the chakras. But you see, the Theosophical Society had been talk, talking about the chakras for thirty years before this was published. So let's see um, the, we have to, to understand what the chakras are. We have to explore some theosophical teaching about the human constitution. I, I will make, us, make it simple. Again, we don't have time to go deep into any of this. But the idea is that we have the physical body, and this physical body has a, an aspect that is can be seen and perceived by our five senses. It's the body that we all know. But there is also an invisible part of the physical body, invisible for most people, uh, something that is beyond the perception of our five senses, which is what we call the etheric double. This is a, a, a thin layer of etheric matter, as it is called in, in theosophical literature, that is all around the physical body. And this etheric body is a, a subtler counterpart of the physical. And they are uh, tightly connected. If we separate the etheric body from the physical body, then the physical body dies. So the etheric body is like a, like a bridge through which all non-physical energies and forms of consciousness come into the physical body. So the, this etheric body can be uh, photographed by the Kirlian photograph uh, method, photographic method, let's say. Um, I'm not sure if this is the etheric body itself or the magnetic fields that run through the etheric body, but it's good enough for us to visualize more or less what the etheric body is. And the reason why I bring this up is because the chakras are invisible structures. Uh, again, when I say invisible, I mean invisible for the five senses. Those who begin to develop psychic perceptions can see them clearly. This is not just a philosophical idea or speculation. But the chakras are positioned, or, uh, in, let's say, on the etheric body. So Ledbetter, for example, said uh, the chakras show themselves, because he could see them, so when you see them, show themselves as saucer-like depressions or vortices at the surface of the etheric double which projects slightly beyond the outline of the dense body, of the part of the body that we normally perceive. So the chakras are on the etheric body, and you can see them in this image. You can see uh, three chakras. They are like these saucer-like uh, structures, depressions, vortices that go into the etheric body. We will see this in more detail. He says, we shall get some idea of the general appearance of a chakra if we imagine ourselves to be looking straight down into the bell of a flower of the morning glory type. You know, the, you, we have there the scientific name. So uh, here the image uh, shows one of these flowers and the chakras look more or less like that, like uh, a flower aspect, you know, the petals on the surface of the uh, etheric body, and then it goes into the etheric body, as in the case of the, the flower. And then he says that there is actually like a stalk that comes from the chakra and goes into the, the spine. Not really the spine, because we are not talking about physical structures. But in Hinduism, they say that within the spine, there is an invisible uh, you know, vessel, let's say, which they call nadi. Nadi is the, the Sanskrit word. 
Uh, they call this main nadi that goes through the, the spine sushumna. So the chakras are connected to the spine, to the sushumna that is within the spine. So let Peter says, the stalk of the flower, if you think of the chakra as a flower, the stalk of the flower in each chakra springs from a point in the spine. So another view might show the spine as a central stem from which flowers shoot forth at in intervals, showing the opening of their bells on, at the surface of the etheric body. So you see in Leadbeater's description, we see that the chakra consists of three parts, let's say. One is the spine center, the center on the spine, or rather on the sushumna, from which the stem springs forth. Then the second part is the stem itself that goes to the surface of the etheric body. And the third part is the, the, the flower aspect, the bell aspect of the chakra that is at the surface of the etheric body. Now, in by the way, this is this was the first time that these aspects of the chakras were described. If you read traditional Hindu literature, they very rarely, if ever, talk about the, the bell aspect of the flower, of the chakra. They normally refer to the chakras, to the spine centers, to the points on the spine, um, and, and not to either the stem or the flower aspect, uh, because they are interested in the flow of Kundalini as Kundalini rises through Sushumna, through the spine, it goes and touches all these spine centers and that activates the chakras. We'll see a little bit about this. Uh, so in Hindu literature, they are concerned about this, the spine centers and they don't describe the bells. You see that there are symbolic lotuses attached to each chakra, uh, but those lotuses are not supposed to be real. They are just a symbol. Uh, actually, in some depictions of the chakras in Hindu literature, you will see that they this is the spine or the sushumna in the spine, and the, the lotuses are in this uh, position, uh, perpendicular. Uh, so the chakras are not like this in the surface of the body in Hindu literature. They are on the spine, uh, and the, the sushumna pierces through them because those lotuses are not the same as the bells that are in the front of the body. These lotuses are just a symbolic representation for, for the yogi to use uh, in meditation, positioned in the spine centers. Now, normally when coming to the, the, the brow chakra, because the brow chakra is not connected to the spine, uh, they do talk about the front part of the brow chakra. But uh, of the rest of them, they normally talk about the, the points. So in modern spirituality, whenever you see the idea of the chakras that are in the front uh, or in the surface of the, the etheric body, uh, you this actually comes from Leadbeater's observations. And actually, not all the chakras are in the front. If you see the lowest chakra there is at the back. Uh, so, but but they are all in the surface of the the etheric uh, body. Now you can see in this image also that there are seven chakras. Uh, this again in traditional Hinduism, different numbers of chakras are listed. Sometimes they normally in tantra, for example, they normally list six chakras. Uh, in Shaivism, they tend to list five. There is also mention of eight chakras, 12 chakras. Um, this is because there are many chakras in our bodies. And not only in the upper part, we have chakras in the hands, in the knees, there are lower chakras, uh, there are chakras at the back. The there are many chakras in, in the body. Most of the, uh, the ideas that many of them are secondary uh, chakras or have secondary functions or very specific functions. So Leadbeater um, identified seven main chakras out, out of all of them. And then the idea of seven is something that um, became popular and modern depictions of the chakras are normally seven. 
Um, and then even modern yogis today tend to talk about seven chakras. But again, all this came from Ledbetter's observations. Uh, of course, Blavatsky had already said that the chakras were seven. The number seven is, is very important in theosophical literature. Uh, when Blavatsky first published this, that there were seven chakras, she was criticized by Hindus because in their, in their books, there aren't seven that are described. Uh, but then that became a common idea today. Anyway, so if we look at the chakras described in theosophical literature, we have them here. There is one at the base of the spine. Uh, I'm going from bottom to top. Then there is a chakra uh, uh, connected to the spleen, to the solar plexus, to the heart, to the throat, between the eyebrows and at the top of the head. There are some Sanskrit names. These centers have different Sanskrit names. Normally in, in Hindu literature, the top of the head chakra is not regarded as a chakra. There is a center there, they call it Sahasrara, but it's uh, traditionally was not regarded as a chakra. Um, but you see that here at the level of the spleen, there is no Sanskrit name for the spleen because uh, Hindu literature mentions a different chakra that theosophical literature does not consider. Uh, theosophical literature, li literature does not consider this chakra not because it doesn't exist. Remember, there are many more chakras than the ones normally listed, but because uh, Ledbetter and other theosophists regarded this chakra that is normally listed in, in Hinduism in place of the spleen chakra, they regarded that chakra as, as a chakra that we should not mess with, let's say. So for example, he said, the spleen chakra is not indicated in the Indian box. Its place is taken by what sometimes is called a sacral chakra called Swadhisthana and it is situated in the neighborhood of the generative organs. You know, in, in modern spirituality, you see this chakra often uh, quoted because uh, if you take it, take the chakras from the Hindu literature, you will see this chakra that is described and it is connected to the sexual organs. Now, let me just say, from our point of view, the arousing of such a center would be regarded as a misfortune as there are serious dangers connected with it. So in the theosophical tradition, uh, when, for example, Ledbetter was taught by one of what we call the, the masters of wisdom in, in our tradition, was taught how to bring, to awaken the different chakras with Kundalini, raising Kundalini. Uh, but in, in, the, in the theosophical tradition, that chakra is not awakened. So the chakras that Ledbetter described are the seven chakras that are awakened uh, in this tradition because the problem is that a stimulation of the Swadhisthana chakra, uh, the one that is connected to the, to the sexual organs, can increase an, uh, the sexual desire and make it even uncontrollable. We see, unfortunately, how you know, he, uh, Hindu swamis or Buddhist monks uh, sometimes are uh, full, uh, uh, just as other religious teachers also, but uh, sometimes they fall into sexual misconduct. Uh, so this is a chakra that um, it's, uh, it's quite delicate. And if you increase the activity by either meditating on that chakra or sending energy to that chakra or making Kundalini pass through that chakra, uh, then uh, that, that can be quite difficult for the person to handle. So that's why in theosophical literature, that chakra is not considered as part of the spiritual path. Now, the other aspect here, you have an image of the situation of the chakras, as Ledbetter and other theosophical clairvoyants saw them. And you see that they are not aligned straight you know, uh, on the spine. 
normally in 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 modern spirituality you tend to see them aligned in this way uh, you see in the second image uh, you have there the lotuses which are the symbols for each chakras in hinduism now in hinduism the chakras are aligned because remember they talk about the spine centers so the spine centers obviously are aligned because they are on the spine um, and therefore if you see a, a hindu description of the chakras you will see all the chakras as i said normally not in front but like this pierced through by uh, sushumna and they are all aligned but if you mean to show the flower aspect uh, of the chakra, the bell aspect of the chakra that is on the surface of the, the, the etheric body, they are not aligned. You see that if we go from the bottom, the bottom you see the, the root chakra um, that, that is uh, on the spine. Then the second chakra that you see there is the actually the third one, the solar plexus chakra, which is aligned. But then you have the spleen chakra that is to the left, the heart chakra that is to the left, and then the others are aligned. Um, so the straight up position in modern spirituality, sometimes people are mixing up, they have to understand what they are seeing there. Sometimes they mix up the, the, the two depictions, the theosophical and the traditional Hindu. Uh, if you see them aligned, you are talking about the spine centers. If you talk about the bells aspects of the chakras, then they are not aligned. And what about the colors? Here in this second picture, uh, we see that typically the chakras in modern spirituality are associated to the seven colors of the, the rainbow. But if you see to the how theosophical clairvoyants have depicted the chakras, they have different colors. Uh, here, I, by the way, I have been showing the images of the chakras underneath the, the camera image here. We are going, uh, as they these images are depicted as they were observed by Theosophical Clairvoyance, and we are going to start the series again in a, in a couple of slides so that you can look at them more in detail now that you know what they are. Uh, but here we are uh, showing the spleen chakra, and you see that it has several different colors. In uh, Hinduism, the, the, the mandalas, the lotuses that are used to, this, to symbolize the different chakras also have all different kinds of colors. They are not of one single color. Um, so the, the, the colors of the chakras as Ledbeater saw them, and the other theosophical clairvoyants agreed with that later, you know. He says, uh, the colors are not exactly those to which we are accustomed in the solar spectrum, but resemble rather the arrangement of colors seen on higher levels in the causal, mental, and astral bodies. So in theosophical literature, we have the, the idea is that we have the physical body, the etheric body, then there is an astral body that forms part of our aura. Then there is a mental body. And then there is a causal body. These are all uh, subtle bodies um, that, that bring the spiritual consciousness into the physical. And Ledbetter says that actually the, the colors of the chakras, in the chakras, they follow a pattern that can be observed also in these other higher bodies. So they are not really, um, you know, of the color of the rainbow. Um, the, according to, the, there is a, a book by Kurt Leland. It's a great book if you are interested in the history of the development of the chakras in the West. Uh, the book is called The Rainbow Body. And according to his research, the person who assigned the rainbow colors to the chakras was the actress uh, Shirley MacLaine because he had designed the line of chakra-based jewelry that was using gemstones of the different colors in the rainbow. And then she assigned those colors to those chakras. And then that, you know, that uh, became accepted in, in popular spirituality. And that's 
how we get the the rainbow rainbow colors in the chakras. And the the image of the chakra that you see here is the root chakra, which has these colors is uh, reddish and orange. So let us now look at the structure and function. And here we start again with the series of chakras from the top to the bottom in the images. Uh, this chakra is the, the crown chakra. Uh, the, sometimes this center is called Sahasrara in Hinduism, although they don't regard it as a chakra normally, as I said. So there are how, how are these chakras formed? What are the chakras? We know that there, there are these depressions uh, in, in the etheric body, um, but the chakras are formed by three forces that converge at those points in the, in the etheric body. The first force is a life force that is coming into the ch chakra from our higher nature, coming through all these different bodies that I mentioned. You know, we have our spiritual nature, and then through the causal, mental, astral body comes a, a life force that is what keeps us alive. Uh, and it comes into the chakras. This life force is has seven aspects, so different aspects goes go through different chakras. We again, we don't have time to go into details, but basically, there is a life force that comes into the chakra from the higher nature, and when it comes into the chakra, it produces on the surface of the the etheric body, it produces a secondary force that generates the kind of whirlpool that the chakra is. So we have the life force coming into the etheric body. And as it meets the next force that we are going to see, it will generate uh, what we may call the petals of the, of the flower. The second force is Kundalini. This is a force that is in the uh, root chakra. Now, again, Kundalini has several layers, that, let's say seven layers, according to theosophical research. And the most external layer is already active in all of humanity. Actually, as the, uh, what we can call nervous activity, the nerve fluid that many clairvoyants and healers would describe, um, it comes from Kundalini, from the most external uh, layer of Kundalini. Uh, and is constantly flowing through our nerves and it keeps the body, uh, the heat of the body and it keeps the communication, you know, of the brain with the body. Um, and this Kundalini chakra is coming, we, we said we have the life force that is coming into the surface of the etheric body and it produces this depression. And then we have Kundalini that is coming through the spine and it goes into the surface of the chakras, forming the stem, and meeting, it meets there the life force. So when the two forces meet, this, there, are, there are circular forces that begin to be produced. The chakras can be seen rotating. Now, the life force rotates in one direction in the chakra, and Kundalini rotates in the other direction. So there is like an interlacing of these two forces and they produce different, depending on what aspect of the life force comes into each chakra is how many petals, let's say, they produce when they meet each other. And then they, they are rotating in different, uh, um, in different mm, movements or directions. Now, this rotation of the chakra sweeps along it along the chakra, a third force, which is the vitality or prana. Um, the, the spleen chakra has the, one of the functions is to absorb prana from the sun. And then the chakra, the spleen chakra, sends prana to all the different chakras, which in its turn distribute the prana around the body to different organs and places. So, we have here the two forces, the life force coming, the kundalini force uh, meeting that life force. And then we have the pranic force that is coming through other 
uh, nadis or other you know vessels which go into the 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 wheel of the chakra and they are distributed in the area that that chakra covers the er area of the body that the chakra covers normally the, these chakras are connected to a physical nervous plexus uh, so the chakras tend to feed the the organs uh, around the the chakra and because the chakras you know in hinduism they talk about five different kinds of prana theosophical literature talks about seven um so this the depending on what current of prana each chakra transports is what kind of function that chakra has again we will see all in detail in the class uh, simply because we don't have enough time today. But the important point, the reason why I'm showing this is that the chakras are a, like, a, like a whirlpool in which several forces are converging. The chakra is not a solid organ or structure. The chakra is simply like if you have three streams of water, that as they come together, they generate a whirlpool. And that whirlpool will depend on the flow of these streams. The whirlpool doesn't have a fixed form. Uh, if one stream gets you know, stronger, it will change the shape and the behavior of the whirlpool. So similarly with the chakras, and this will be important later. Now, these chakras have two main functions. And one, the first function is more or less what I have already described. This is a physiological function, is to absorb and distribute these three forces, the life force that comes from our higher nature, the vitality that we gather from the sun, prana, and the nerve force, which comes from kundalini. And these three forces are necessary to keep the body alive and healthy and working properly. So that's the, the function of the chakras that is working in, in every human being at this point in evolution. Um, this, as Ledbetter says, the three forces are not directly connected with a person's mental and emotional life, but only with the bodily well-being of the person. So these three forces are just physiological. You may be surprised that Kundalini is a physiological force, uh, some people consider it as a spiritual force. Well, the, the word spiritual is vague. I mean, Kundalini is energy, and uh, it, can, it can serve to produce different things in the body. Uh, in, the, uh, in the normal functioning of Kundalini right now, it produces the nervous activity. Uh, but Kundalini can also induce... Uh, other kinds of activities in the chakras as we are going to see. So the physiological functions of the different chakras, the seven chakras is here um, summarized in this table. So the root chakra is the source of the nerve fluid, uh, you know, the, the Kundalini. Then the spleen chakra is connected to the, to the spleen, the functioning of the spleen, the organ, and also to general vitality because it's the chakra that distributes vitality around the body. Then the navel or the solar plexus chakra is connected to the stomach, the pancreas, the liver, the adrenals. It's in general connected to, in the body, to the digestive system because it's connected to the plexus of nerves that are uh, involved in the digestive system. The heart chakra is connected to the heart, the thymus, the immune system in general. The throat chakra uh, affects the thyroid and parathyroid and all the hormones that they produce. The brow chakra is connected to the functioning of the pituitary gland. And the crown chakra is connected to the pineal gland and to the brain in general. And of course, the pineal gland is connected also to the, the sleep cycle, so it can affect the uh, sleep, etc. So these functions are not arbitrary. They have to do both with 
the, the, the connection of the chakra to the nervous plexuses in the body, and also to the kind of prana, one of the seven kinds of prana, that that chakra is mainly distributing. Now, because the chakras are connected to the physical health, of course, there have been methods developed of healing uh, where mm, they try, these methods try to act on the chakras. Now, it's important to remember that the chakra is nothing per se, is the con where, where these three streams come together. So whatever is going on with the chakras depends on what is going on with these three streams of uh, energy and with other things too, other forms of energy that are not physical. We are going to see that uh, soon. Um, but the idea here is that if the a chakra is not working properly, it's because the energies that are coming into it are not working properly. The chakra is just the the you know the last link in a chain of causes and effects. So Dora Kunz, Dora Kunz was one of these clairvoyants that I mentioned. She worked all her life in healing. She actually developed a method of healing energy before Reiki and before all these uh, energy healing uh, methods became popular. She, dis she uh, developed a method of healing energy that uh, is called uh, therapeutic touch, which is used in, in several hospitals. She developed this along with doctors. Uh, she worked in collaboration with doctors. And she would always use the chakras uh, as tools for diagnosis. She would see that when a chakra wasn't working properly, then uh, the organs and areas of the body uh, that are connected with that chakra will eventually develop uh, some illness if, if the flow of energies are not connected. Now, in her method, she said, in contrast with some other healers, I do not advocate working directly on the chakras except that it is always helpful to send energy to the solar plexus. Uh, when, when a person, uh, let me give some more, more um, uh, context on this, we will see that the solar plexus is connected with lower emotions. By that we mean fear, uh, anger, or things like that. So if a person is in a, in, in a state of panic, then some energy is, uh, to calm the solar plexus can help that person uh, manage uh, better that state of uh, unrest. Now, because the solar chakras we will see is connected with these emotions, the, you need to know what you are doing because if you are sending energy, uh, a kind of energy that will further stimulate the solar plexus, you will deepen the, the state. Uh, the, that state of depression, fear, uh, anxiety, whatever it is. Uh, so, but in in her method of therapeutic touch, she she teaches, uh, you know, if the person is in that state as a temporary remedy, you can try to calm down that chakra. Uh, so she says it is helpful to send energy to the solar plexus. You have to visualize the right color to send the right kind of energy. And then she says, and since the heart chakra is the center of higher energies and of integration, it too is a focus for healing. So these two centers can be, you can, you can, in the in the method that she described, you know, you can do some on these two centers, but otherwise she says that she does not advocate working directly on the chakras. Why is this her her method was in fixing the whole aura? Because with the, the reason for this is that fixing a chakra, if you do it correctly, because you can do it in the wrong way also, but if you even if you do it correctly, fixing a chakra is just a temporary measure. Because remember, the chakra is the effect of the energies that are coming through the person. So you may, like in these currents of energy that suppose in a, in a river, there are these three streams of water that generate the whirlpool. 
Um, you may add another current of water to modify the, the, the functioning of the whirlpool, but as soon as that energy is removed, that current of water is removed in this analogy, then eventually the whirlpool will come back to whatever uh, the, the three currents are producing. So evidently, if you want a more, more lasting effect, you have to address the overall energies that are coming into the chakra. Just fixing the chakra may last for a few days, and then it will get uh, out of gear, let's say, again. Now, in emergent, there may be an emergency kind of um, you know, treatment uh, in which, for the time being, you may try to help the person to stabilize the, the chakra, to give time to the person to deal with the emotional and mental unrest. Uh, so in extremes, it's just like in medicine, if an, an organ is not, is not working properly, you may have to do a surgery and then address what got the organ sick. So with the chakras, in the theosophical tradition in general, the idea is, you know, working on the chakras specifically is just more in an emergency to produce a temporary um, release or relief of the, the situation, but then you have to work on all the energies that are producing that. Um, now, the I know of, you know, the, the, the second reason why theosophical tradition doesn't recommend to work directly on the chakras is that, you know, it, it, is, it is a delicate process. Uh, it's not just sending energy. You, if you just send energy, you can get the chakra out of gear. You know, you have to know what kind of energy you have to send, what, what is the right visualization. You have to be trained in that. Um, and you can actually, I know of people who have gone to get their chakras, you know, I don't know, purified or whatever. Um, and they had bad effects uh, for a couple of weeks. So I'm not saying that none of this, again, you, there is freedom of thought in the Theosophical Society. You can, you know, discern for yourself. Um, but just know that it's, it's a delicate process. So don't just go to a random person. Uh, that would be my advice. You are free to do whatever you think fit. Um, but just know that it's a delicate process. And in any case, it will be only temporary. Now, regular meditation on the chakras, if you, are every, if you are meditating on the chakras every day and you are constantly sending energies there, that if you are doing it in the right way, that can help. If you are doing it in the wrong way, that can produce even permanent problems. So again, all of this, don't take anything, or, or the approach in the theosophical tradition is not, don't take these things lightly. Uh, take them seriously, study, learn, uh, and then be careful, experiment if you want, and see carefully the results, you know, be careful with all of this. Now, beyond these three physical forces, there are some more forces that come, which are not physical, into the chakra and that can affect the, uh, the functioning of the chakra. And this is connected with the second functions, the second function of the chakras. We saw the first one is to distribute in the body these three different forces. The second function is to bring down into the physical con consciousness the higher, the energy from the higher bodies, energies and perceptions from the higher bodies. So we feel emotions in the physical body, for example. In the theosophical tradition, emotions are generated in the astral body, and then they are generated first there, and then they are communicated to the physical brain and nerves and hormones through the chakras to the physical body. Uh, the same with thoughts. Thoughts are produced on this, the mental body and communicated to the physical body through the chakras. And the spiritual impulses also uh, uh, happen on the higher consciousness and are communicated to the physical body through the chakras. So this second function has two sub 
uh, or two possibilities. There is the normal psychological function of the, of the chakras and what we could call a paranormal psychic function. The normal psychological functions that each of the chakras are connected to are the following. The root and the spleen do not respond to emotional or mental energies. They are just involved in the physical distribution of forces. The navel, as I said, or the solar plexus, is connected to lower emotions. So whenever you feel lower emotions, that impacts the solar plexus. And uh, whenever if you are sensitive and you, you are perceiving lower emotions from the environment, from other people, from the environment, you do it through the navel chakra. This is a very delicate chakra for that reason. If you mess that chakra up, to, to put it colloquially, uh, then you may be unable to filter the lower emotions and you become open to all these kinds of lower emotions. So there is uh, normally in theosophical literature, a lot of warnings about you know, messing with this chakra. Try to leave it alone, um, you know, unless you know what you are doing and only in uh, on emergencies, as, as I said, you know, as Dor Dora Kunz was saying, um, and try to work on your emotions, purify your emotions. And that's the best way that the solar plexus chakra will be in perfect health. If you don't give up so much into the lower emotions, then the lower the, the, the solar plexus will work perfectly well. If your solar plexus has a problem, again, you could try to address it by trying to heal that chakra, uh, but then your emotions will, will mess it up you know, soon, in a few days. So uh, acting on the chakra itself is just a temporary fix, at least in the theosophical tradition. The heart is connected to higher emotions, love, compassion. This is a good center for meditation because um, we can, if we stimulate the heart chakra, we can become more receptive uh, uh, to these emotions. So meditation on the heart chakra, uh, if it is a cautious meditation, don't overdo it um, because again, even the heart chakra can be gotten out of gear. But uh, this is a safer center for, uh, for meditation, not the navel in the theosophical tradition. Then the throat is connected to with the lower mind. Also, the throat is not a best a great center to, to meditate on. Then the brow chakra is connected to imagination and creativity, and the crown chakra to metaphysical and philosophical thought. So all this, you know, the when we are working with spiritual thinking then our crown chakra begins to be more activated and bring that to the brain. Uh, imagination, creativity, visualization is connected to the brow chakra, etc. So these are the psychological functions of these chakras. Uh, now, uh, Dora Kun says activity at the emotional level may be initiated through the solar plexus, but of course, it comes through the whole aura and the etheric field as well, for it is impossible to separate the two functions. Remember that the chakra is, so we have the, the aura, the emotional body, let's say, and there are different aspects of the emotional body, matter or substance of the emotional body, you know, it's non-physical substance that is activated by the different emotions. And that, so if we activate the, the aspect of the emotional body connected to the lower emotions, then our aura is vibrating like that, and that is coming into the solar plexus, and the solar plexus gets uh, working improperly because the aura is vibrating in the wrong way. So again, this is why you have a cascade of effects. You have the psychological activity, the lower emotion, you have the vibration in the aura, and then you have the chakra. If you work just on the chakra, and you are not working on the other aspects, that would be just a temporary relief. If you act with, with therapeutic touch or any other healing method to calm the vibrations of the aura, 
that is more lasting than the chakra, than working on the chakra. But if you are not working on the emotional aspect, then you will again produce the same vibrations in your aura, which again will produce the problem in the chakra. So the best is always trying to go to the cause of the problem uh, rather than working on the more superficial effects. Um, we are getting to the end. We have a few more minutes. Uh, let me say briefly about the paranormal function of the chakras, which is a psychic function. Let Peter said, besides keeping alive the physical vehicle, vehicle, the four centers or chakras have another function which comes into play only when they are awakened into full activity and they are awakened into full activity by the raising of Kundalini. The function of each of these etheric centers when fully aroused is to bring down into physical consciousness whatever may be the quality inherent in the astral center which corresponds to it. So in the theosophical tradition, these seven chakras that are on the etheric body are the physical chakras. We have also seven chakras and more on the astral body, which corresponds with the physical chakras. There are seven chakras on the mental body, etc. So what Kundalini does, Kundalini stimulates the etheric chakras and connects those chakras with the chakras in the astral body. And what that produces is that now we start having what we could call astral perceptions or psychic perceptions. So here on this table, you see, well, the root chakra has no um, uh, psychic function, it's just the source of Kundalini. Then through the spleen, when you connect the physical or the etheric spleen with the astral spleen, you start getting vague memories of astral journeys, uh, either if you project your astral body while awake or what happens when we go fall asleep, we are on the astral body and whatever we do on the astral plane, you bring it, when you wake, wake up, you, you bring a vague memory of it. Uh, that's the spleen chakra. The navel chakra gives you a vague awareness of astral influences are these feelings that some psychic people have, but these are vague feelings uh, that come, they don't know very well the source, they just feel this, they may call it their intuition, or, um, but the, the, the navel chakra brings you some connection to, the, to the, the astral plane, but not very clear. Now the heart chakra, when it is connected by Kundalini with the astral heart chakra, it gives you awareness of the joys and sorrows of others. Now this, you know, if you have equanimity, if you know how to have emotions without being affected by them, this is great. But if not, then you come to the mercy of whatever the environment around you is. If it is a joyful environment, great. But then you have really a hard time to deal in, with environments where there, there is uh, sadness or sorrow, etc. Now, the throat chakra produces clairaudience. When they are connected, you can hear sounds of the astral plane. The brow chakra produces clairvoyance. And the crown chakra allows you to leave the body in full consciousness uh, in the astral body, to the astral body. So you see that none of these functions are spiritual per se. The, the awakening of Kundalini, the normal awakening of Kundalini, just produces psychic powers because it connects the chakras to the astral chakras. Sometimes you see in the Upanishads, in Hindu literature, there is a mixture. Sometimes they describe Kundalini as just producer of psychic powers. And sometimes they talk about Kundalini as producing liberation. Now, um, that, that, that confusion makes people think that by doing a pranayama exercise or by whatever other means they want to raise kundalini that they were they will attain enlightenment but at least in the theosophical tradition that's not the case and in kashmir shaivism for example they agree with the theosophical view they talk about different kinds of kundalinis and they say the kundalini that can produce spiritual enlightenment is very difficult to awaken 
the one that most people awaken is the psychic Kundalini. Because in the theosophical tradition, there is a third function beyond the, phys the physiological and the psychic. There is a spiritual function of the chakras, but only the two higher chakras, the brow chakra and the crown chakra, uh, have a spiritual um, function. The brow chakra connects us to the, to the soul, to what in theosophy we call the higher manas, and we begin to be aware of our our nature as a soul, and the crown chakra connects us to the divine wisdom, to what we call buddhi in theosophy. Now, this kind of kundalini, you know, remember there are several layers, uh, and this, uh, the awakening of these functions have to do with the deeper layers of, layers of kundalini, which cannot be awakened by um, by the methods in Hatha Yoga, you know, breathing exercises or positions of the body or, or mudras or, or, or mantras. Um, to awaken these, these deeper levels of Kundalini, um, you, what you need first is to be able to raise in meditation, raise your consciousness to the spiritual nature. And also you have to have the, the higher bodies developed because these spiritual functions come because you connect the chakras of the higher bodies to the chakras in the etheric body. If the chakras on your higher bodies are not awakened, then the spiritual function cannot happen. Uh, so the, the way to awaken this, the spiritual function of the chakras is by leading a deep spiritual life. And this is why Blavatsky in her system of development she did not work with the lower chakras, but only with the chakras in the head. And this is how we are going to end this talk. She called them the master chakras. She says, our seven chakras are all situated in the head. And, and in these master chakras, uh, it is these master chakras which govern and rule the seven, for there are seven principal plexuses in the body. You know, this was... In 1890, this was part of Blavatsky's esoteric instructions to a group of uh, pupils that she had. And here she says, there are seven plexuses in the body uh, and the, the seven chakras. Um, she says we, if we call, uh, that there are the seven plexuses in the body and 42 minor plexuses. And then she says, if the term plexus in this application does not bring you the right kind of idea. Uh, she says, then call them chakras or padmas or wheels. You know, this is uh, among the first times that a Western person is teaching about the chakras. That's why not even the name had been settled. Because in Hindu literature, the chakras are sometimes called chakras or wheels, and sometimes they are called padmas or lotuses. So later on, it's through the Theosophical Society that the name Chakra became the common name for this. Anyway, so then she says, uh, there, uh, there are seven cavities in the brain which are quite empty during life. And it is in these that spiritual visions might, must be reflected if they are to remain in physical memory. These centers are in occultism called the seven harmonies, the scale of divine harmonies. So there are seven chakras in the head. She says, for example, the sixth is the pineal gland, which is hollow and empty during life. The seventh is the whole of the skull. The fifth is the third ventricle. The fourth, the pituitary body or gland. Uh, and this is more technical. She says, when manas, when the soul, when we can raise our consciousness to the level of the soul, and manas is united to the divine spark, Atma Bhuti, then that acts on, the, on these three higher cavities, radiating and sending forth a halo of light. And this is visible in the case of very holy, a very holy person. So you see that sometimes the saints are depicted with a halo. That's the light of the higher Kundalini acting through the head chakras. And then she says, this is why we begin with the mastery of that organ, 
which is situated at the base of the brain in the pharynx and called by anatomists the pituitary body. So in Blavatsky's system, there is no work with the lower chakras. Uh, she actually says the emphasis on muladhara, on the root chakra, shows the materialistic approach. She was quite critical of all these things. The materialistic approach of these schools because that will only give you psychic powers. Uh, she said the spiritual approaches are interested in the head chakras. You know, of course, that was her approach. As I said, uh, in the Theosophical Society, we have freedom of thought. Um, but this is the, the esoteric view that um, people are, or clairvoyants in the, in the Theosophical tradition have developed. As I said, in the in the coming class, we are going to deal with all of this in more detail, but I hope that this lecture was instructive and that can help you understand the subject better. Thank you.